the, the program seems to be going pretty well because I will try to deal with some aspects that are kind of related to the previous presentation and some of the questions that came up in the question time. So that seemed to be quite relevant in terms of timing. Of course, don't expect me to answer some of the questions Andy Waterhouse wasn't able to answer because uh, <laughs> yeah. if he wasn't able, then it's going to be difficult for me. But it's actually interesting to see that some of these aspects are still quite topical for winemakers and particularly the fact that somebody was asking about, okay, how should we decide about SO2 addition and generally speaking about uh, the antioxidants the management of antioxidants in the wine, depending on the response of the wine, the, the characteristics of individual wine, whether it's a wine for long-term storage, short-term storage, whether it's a Cabernet or a Merlot, whether it's a Sauvignon Blanc or a, or a Chardonnay. There is this aspect, there is this, this uh, question all the time, how much oxygen is good, is adequate for my wine, how do I decide the, the, the management of everything that's got to do with oxidation, how do I take decisions about that? So we try, we had the question all the time and we developed some, a tool that today we think can assist winemakers in the process of decision making from that point of view. So altogether, I guess, um, you know, we can look at this problem from many different angles. Uh, very often today we seem to be talking about things like um, early oxidation of wine and it's becoming quite topical in some regions that didn't have this problem before, like in Burgundy. Everybody's talking about premature oxidation of their white wines, so wines that were supposed to age 15 years, with no problem now, after two years, they already oxidize. Problem is also that those, some of those bottles will cost 100 euros. So, you know, if you want to age them, and then a couple of years later, you just pour them down the drain, not so good. But you see that comes out quite often, the need to make wines that are more resistant to oxidation. Very important today in an export market where wines are a lot, uh, have a lot of stress, for going through long travels overseas and so on, very important to make resistant wines. And you also have this concept that the big wines, the great wines are very strongly, stronger resisting against oxidation. So again, concept of association between the quality, the overall quality of the wine and its ability to resist to oxidation. And there's also been some statements about the fact that overall with climate change, with global warming, we see wines losing this resistance to oxidation. That's in particular in these historical regions where wines used to be very strong against oxidation, and now they seem to be weakening up a little bit. So practically speaking, what we see is this process of aging the wine. Okay, every wine, we say, it improves with a certain period of time spent in the bottle. It could be days, weeks, it could be years, but there is this notion around the wine industry where with aging, the quality of a wine, even in the case of a white wine, its overall quality will improve with a period of aging. So we go from something not quite ripe and completely good to something that shows all the complexity and the, 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 the capacity. Sometimes this process can be very slow. So you might not see this, um, this development as quickly as you want in terms of the lifespan of a wine. So your consumers might still drink the wine when it's a bit young. But the real problem is that sometimes this problem process is very fast much faster than what we want to be. And so your consumers, and maybe yourself already in the winery, might go and taste some, go back and taste some of the wines you put in bottle a few months before, and you might not like what you're tasting. So, of course, that's a big concern. And as I said, you know, that comes back to several different points of view. Some people are just concerned about this. There's also an observation that some varieties seem to have this problem more than others. But overall, the problem persists in the wine industry. Some might say, okay, let's just get rid of oxygen. You know, let's just do everything we can to avoid any oxygen at any stage of the winemaking. Problem is that there is also this positive contribution of oxygen. You know, we know that, for example, some wines have a tendency to develop reductive of flavors when they sit in the bottle. So, of course, these are wines where you want to deliver a little bit of oxygen somewhere in the life of this wine to prevent this problem. So there is also this notion that, okay, oxygen can break a wine, it can cause a lot of problems, oxidative of flavors, browning, but it also contribute favorably, particularly some aspects of red wine production, but also in white wine, we can see that with little doses of oxygen coming in, the wine overall quality will improve. So we can't simply say, okay, let's just get rid of any oxidative phenomena and the wine will be good. No, it's not the case. We just have to be able to find the sweet spot where we stay in the make side of the story and we don't go in the breaks part of the problem. A bit of a paradox that today we have a lot of tools available in the industry, not only enclosures, but a lot of other equipment, sometimes quite expensive ones, 
to control and to manage how much oxygen you're putting in your system. You can do inert pressing, you can do inert crush today, you can take, uh, introduce a lot of technology in your production that will allow you to, to control the amount of oxygen that your wine is being exposed to. You just don't know what, you're not able to say how much you should give to your wine, to every specific wine. So the problem is really to make the match between what you can do and what you should do. How do you, do you look at that from a practical point of view? I mean, we'll be talking before, Andrew came back to several times during his presentation about having some indicators about that, having some indicators about how much oxygen one would need. What's a sweet spot for a wine? How much oxygen is good for my wine? I mean, practically speaking, this concept of oxidability is a wine likely to oxidize, more or less likely to oxidize. It comes back to some chemical factors, you know, which could, we could identify, for example, with the speed of oxygen consumption, ones that are consuming oxygen quite fast. Are they ones that overall should be protected from oxygen? So that could be an indicator. Or from another point of view, more related to the, to the intrinsic chemical evolution of the wines, should we be looking at the fact that wines are losing, as Andrew was saying, losing more SO2. So this ratio between the amount of oxygen that they're consuming and the SO2 that is being lost in the process, would that be a good marker for that? Or we should be looking at other antioxidants. For example, if, we, if we're using additions of ascorbic acid, could that be a marker? Or just a simple oxidation of phenolics in the wine, because as you see in the first step of oxidation, and we'll go back to that in a minute, is the oxidation of phenolics forming quinones. So is that the step we should look, the marker we should take into account, the indicator? Or are there, those indicators, the more interesting ones, are just the quality ones, the browning, the color, or the aroma evolution? But as we said, you know, some of those markers, it's difficult to take them as absolute because uh, there's a good side to the story and there's a bad side to the story. Just think about the color evolution. You might want to stabilize it, so you want a bit of color evolution. Too much will turn to oxidation. And same for aromas. No aroma development in terms of oxidative, it might actually mean aroma development in terms of reductive aromas, so no good either. But let's have a look at some of those markers, at least the chemical ones, the physiochemical factors. Could they be representative? Could we choose one that is representative of this oxidability concept? So could we say, for example, the ones that are consuming oxygen very quickly are actually the ones that will also, is that oxygen consumption also representative of all the other phenomena that we say, of loss of SO2, for example? So here you see we got five wines. Two Chardonnay, two Sauvignon, and a Muscadet. These are French wines, but I think you can, we can generalize this behavior. And you see that some of these wines are quite fast at consuming oxygen. Some others are much less rapid. You see there are two that certainly are very fast. One was one of the Chardonnay, and the other one is one of the Sauvignon Blanc. So these are fast consuming, fast oxygen consuming wines. So we give them six and a half, nearly six and a half milligrams of oxygen, and they consume it quite rapidly. The other ones are quite slow at consuming them. If we look at what these fast-consuming ones are doing in terms of brown and color development, someone is asking about, is the wine changing its color? Well, you see the one is actually quite strong. You know, that's the amount, the, the color change at 420, the absorbance at 420, how much it has increased for consumption of one milligram of oxygen in this experiment. When the overall consumption was five milligrams, so normalized per milligram of oxygen, you see one has been having quite a bit of color development, but the other one is certainly not one, not developing a lot of color. So we cannot really say that measuring oxygen consumption, speed of oxygen consumption will allow us to say, okay, these ones are also going to browning more faster. No, that's not the case. You see that there was another wine that was certainly much stronger in terms of browning for the same amount of oxygen consumed. And this was not a fast oxygen consuming one. Let's look at another one of the indicators we proposed the amount of SO2 lost for amount of oxygen consum consumed. And that also interesting, but not necessarily applicable everywhere. You see those two fast consuming are actually quite good in terms of, so fast consuming seem to correspond, at least in this very small set, to relatively fast, uh, relatively important losses of SO2. But at the same time, you see that there's another wine that is not losing a loss of SO2, but in terms of browning is actually the worst one. So you can never take one of these indicators and describe the overall phenomena of, uh, uh, of wine and oxygen interaction and wine oxidation 
from all the different points of view that from a winemaker's perspective you might want to take into account. Particularly these two, that for one reason or another are representative of things that in the winery you take care about, you, you worry about. The loss of SO2 when a wine is exposed to oxygen and the color development. So there isn't one marker that speaks for everybody, for everything, okay? So different points of view, different aspects that we take into consideration, different elements of the story, different behaviors of different wines. So we cannot generalize from a wine perspective. Okay, it's good to come and talk about um, Andrew Waterhouse in this type of presentation because now you know everything about this, right? So I don't have to, to describe any of these oxidation chains, phantom reaction, acetaldehyde, quinones. You know, the, 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 the central point is when these quinones are formed, they react with a lot of other things. So they are the sort of vectors of all these uh, changes, particularly at the sensory level that we observe when a wine is exposed to oxygen. And of course, there's SO2, there's other antioxidants as well, you know, glutathione could come from the grapes, could come from yeast metabolism. There's various factors that will take place in the picture. In fact, there's a lot of factors. You know, there are these antioxidants, there is the metals, we were saying, there is oxygen, and there is the, the, the presence of these oxidizable compounds, so the, the, the phenolics that are gonna be oxidized. So one might guess also that's more of that, something is gonna happen to a higher extent. So there's a lot of elements in there. In fact, you know, you have the, the, if you want to list them, you have the presence of the different substrates that could form the quinones that are then propagating the oxidation reactions around in the wine. So these are mainly catechins and hydroxycinamic acids. They come from the grapes. And so, of course, there could be several aspects driving, leading, the, uh, um, affecting their presence in the finished wine. Where the grapes are coming from, the way the vineyards are managed, the, the way the must is prepared, you could extract more of those. You could remove them through fining or through oxygenation of the must. So there's a lot of factors affecting that particular component of the big oxidation picture. There's, of course, the oxidation catalyst, you know, iron and copper. And we were saying, if ideally you can make a wine without that, you'll be safe from any oxidation. You be probably might be having more reduction problems, but you'll be safe from oxidation. But as we had, good luck with that just the fact of removing them completely. And you have to be completely removing them because these are catalysts, they will cycle back in the system. So even if you have little traces, they will still drive the, the, the oxidation chain. So it's not easy to just get rid of them because it has to be a complete removal. And then there's all these antioxidants. Some of those we add them, so of course we know how much we're adding, we know that we are adding, but some others are coming from the grapes. And among them, there's also the polyphenols, which are themselves substrate of oxidation, so vector, forming vectors of oxidation like quinones, but at the same time, they could participate to those oxidations and block some of those oxidation mechanisms. So again, it's quite a complicated picture with a lot of, it's like a movie with a lot of characters in it. You know, like if you wanna just, at every time of the story, understand what's going on, you have to be able to, to really look in deeply into those factors. Essentially, you have to be able to do a lot of analysis. Do a lot of analysis for all those chemicals that we spoke about, metals, phenolic profiles, the antioxidants that will be in the grapes, and so on. At every step of the wine making, so it's not just doing one analysis at one point of the story. You have to follow the way they're evolving during time and try to understand if the way you're operating is affecting them in a positive or negative way, and so it's potentially helping you in making wines that are more resistant to oxidation or actually not giving you enough modifications in the composition of the wine in terms of making wines that are stronger against oxidation. Now, not always we like to do all these analyses, okay? Analyses are expensive. Not always this type of analysis, particularly if we're looking at some profiling of uh, organic molecules like phenolics. Not always you'll be able to do them in a winery. But most important, not always you'll be able to do them in a way that helps you in your decision-making process. You got a must. For example, you want to know if your pressing on that mast is being extracting too much of those phenolics, for example. Mast is reacting very quickly. You need to act very quickly. You need to, I mean, your process at a mast level, everything is happening very quickly. You don't have the time to send analysis to an external lab and wait for the response, which will probably come back two days after. But even if you had a lab internally being able to do those analysis, during vintage time, with a lot of things happening at the same time, it might not be easy for you to have the results in time to take a decision and say, okay, let's stop the pressing here, 
oh, let's find this mass to a higher extent. Let's add some more fining agents because it's got, still got some of those oxidizable compounds in there, which we don't want in the wine. So complicated and sometimes not very effective, practically speaking. So we started thinking about that and we started wondering, okay, what could be a different approach if, if a conventional, if you want, approach is to just to do all these analyses and then good luck with that once again. Could we just try to measure the process? Just could we develop tools that allow us to, in a way, nearly simulate, but let's not say simulate, but just try to measure the process, just to go in a, in a sort of specific way to the oxidation phenomena and try to, to quantify the things that participate to that, or at least some of the things that participate to that, in a way that is user friendly for the dimension of, for the context of a winery. So essentially, the center of the oxidation phenomena in many ways is this transformation of phenolics into quinones, which are then, as we say, interacting with a lot of other things in the wine environment. So that's the, 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 the phenomenon that we want to measure. And from an analytical point of view, what is interesting is that this oxidation involves a flow of electrons. So analytically, one good thing, one interesting thing to take into account that we might want to measure is actually this generation of electrons, this current that we induce in the system when any oxidative phenomenon is taking place. More interesting or more informative from an analytical point of view is if we could also, based on this notion of oxidation potential, so the fact that different compounds will oxidize a different potential, if we could run a scan during our analysis based on this oxidation potential and pick the oxidation of these different compounds, we will be not only able to have an information about the quantity of, this com of some of these compounds, but also a profile, which in itself is a more complex information, which as you will see, might be able to describe a complex picture with more level of detail compared to just a single number. So if we're able to do these two things, measure the current, but not only at one point, but across a range of oxidations, we will be able to know a little bit about individual compounds and the, the, the complexity of the system that we're dealing with. And in fact, that's what you typically do during what we call electrochemical analysis. Some of you might be familiar with the redox potential measurement. Some of you might have tried to do that in your winery or you might have read about in the analogy books or in uh, analogy literatures. That fits into this category of analytical procedures. That gives you a value. What's more interesting in, uh, in this type of analytical techniques that are based on scanning for oxidative, for oxidizable compounds, is actually that you obtain a fingerprint. And these fingerprints, although it might not be as complex as an infrared spectrum, for example, it contains some very interesting information. But most important, is specific to the fact that during the analysis, what you do, you're causing this oxidation and you're measuring the consequence of it, so the election flow. So it's very relevant, very pertinent, very relevant to the context of what can be oxidized in a wine and the consequences of that. So it seems to be very interesting from that point of view. Now, these are the, one of the most used uh, analytical techniques from, from this point of view is what, we call, what is called voltammetry. Okay, so you apply a potential to an electrode and you obtain this electrochemical fingerprint, okay? Because this potential is changing during time based on the concept that we say different molecules are oxidizing at different uh, oxida oxidative potentials. It's been around for quite a while. It's been around for actually a long time. It's applied in a, in a variety of ranges of industries and it's applied a lot for research. The problem when you try to apply this to wine is that what you are oxidizing are phenolics and as you all know, when phenolics are oxidizing a lot, they precipitate, okay? They form big molecules that are precipitating. Where do they precipitate? Where they are oxidizing, so on the surface of your electrode. So in conventional voltammetry, after each analysis you do, you have a layer of precipitated phenolics blocking your electrode from interacting with your wine. So you have to recondition your electrode, polish it with abrasive paper, typically, and then recalibrate it. So that works well in a lab. Doesn't necessarily work that well if you're running hundreds of samples during vintage. Imagine you're doing your maturity controls, okay? Where you measure your sugar, acidity, and maybe uh, nitrogen during grape ripening to decide a little bit about when you want to harvest. Samples are coming in at a high rate. You have to analyze them quickly 
because they oxidize, because they're not stable samples, uh, yeast will start growing in them, and you need a response quickly. So certainly you don't want to be polishing your electrodes along with all the other things you have to do, okay? Now today there's a possibility actually, and this is what we did in developing this tool, that's when we thought, okay, this technology could be interesting for the wine industry. It's the ability to miniaturize an electrochemical system into a little strip of plastic, or even a paper, but we work on plastic today, where you have your electrode, counter electrode, and uh, reference electrode, all miniaturized into this little strip of paper, which is disposable. So you don't have this problem of re having to recondition your electrode anymore. You put one drop of sample, which by the way, you don't even need to dilute or centrifuge with the electrodes we had developed. So as it comes out of a press, as it comes out of your, as you prepare it for your maturity control, when you crush your grapes, typically people do it in a little bag, take a drop of that, you put it on an electrode, and you obtain your electrochemical fingerprint. So what we did was to develop a little portable potential stat, which is the typical electrochemical device you need to do for this voltammetric analysis, which can host directly these electrodes into, the, into a little slot that is on the machine. And as you can see, just one little drop of sample is needed. You don't need to centrifuge or dilute, so very, very practical from a, from a, a routine point of view. And you obtain your fingerprint, and we use this a lot in the context of wine oxidability. Looking at oxidation substrates, phenolics, oxidizable phenolics that could be present in the grapes, the way they could evolve during the winemaking process, and I'll show you a little bit of applications of stuff that we've been doing now on finished wines, going back to this concept of predicting wine oxidability. Okay, so that's an example of the typical fingerprints you can obtain on, um, on grapes. That's a variety of grape um, varietals from uh, some experimental vineyards that we have uh, where our facility is located in France. So these are grapes at maturity, and you see that the profile is very different. Now I know you're gonna say, okay, uh, these are just profiles, what are we gonna do about it? But be with me for a second. For the moment, okay, let's live with the profiles. Interesting is that they're very different. Okay, so we can, shop, we can pick some complexity that exists, some, ver some specificity that exists in, uh, in different grapes. And I haven't shown it here, but I can tell you, we've been following this particular experimental vineyards for three years, and the profile that we get for Riesling is always this Riesling type. The profile we get for different varieties, it always fits. So there's a certain element of typicality of the varietals that we can pick with this type of technique. And interesting, the technique is very quick and easy to, to implement. So that's a typical thing we can obtain when we look at grapes, for example. That's a typical thing that we can obtain when we monitor Mast oxidation. Now, mast oxidation could be accidental. We crush grapes, we got the mast. By the time we transfer it, it's getting oxidized. It can also be um, deliberate. Some winemakers are deliberately exposing mast to oxygen to remove some of those phenolics, to remove some of those oxidizable phenolics so that you don't find them in the wine. This was developed many years ago in Germany. They used to call it hyperoxidation. It was pretty strong oxidation. Now people are looking at this more as um, controlled oxidation in that the doses of oxygen that you give to your mast are usually much, much softer. But as you can see, the interesting thing is that you can monitor what is happening because the, the question winemakers have about this all the time is, I'm not very sure when I need to stop. I know that I'm doing some potentially good thing by removing some of those oxidizable compounds, phenolics that I don't want in my finished wine but I'm not sure when I need to stop. What I really like to have is a real-time assessment of how these phenolics are, are being removed in my system. Because experience has shown that it's not always the same. Every mast will react in a different way. And you see here, we have three saturations, so what we do, we start, we prepare our mast, we saturate with oxygen, so we're around eight milligrams per liter, we let that oxygen cons being consumed by the mast, then we resaturate again. And at the end of each saturation, we, we collect our voltammetric scan. And you see how this is changing. So you see how the, um, the oxidizable compounds in the grapes are being removed by this treatment. And in the case of a Riesling, quite phenolic, you can go quite heavily on the thing and you still have some materials being removed. Now in the case of a Chardonnay, which was certainly much less phenolic, you see that just two saturations were more than enough to reach a point where nothing else was happening. So, 
Another interesting observation for this technique, because it's so practical and so responsive to phenolic compound and all the other antioxidants that you have in your system, you can use it to monitor when, when you are deliberately bringing oxygen in the picture, you can use it to monitor what's actually happening in your wine, so that, or in your mast in this case, so that you can follow things and not go too far and possibly have your little historical data telling you that when you reach whatever, and I'm going to talk about that whatever in a minute, then it's fine. Then you're fine. Then your wine is going to be stable enough for what you want to do. And by the way, we did the same thing, although I'm talking more about uh, white wine. By the way, we did the same thing during microx. And again, you have a very interesting way to follow the way things are moving during your microx. And you see this was a Pinot Noir. And you see between the control and during the treatment, you can follow, you can follow the way the phenolic compounds in your wine are changing as a consequence of exposure to oxygen. Another interesting approach that we took was to think about this technique from the point of view of understanding a little bit better what you add into your wine as your common winemaking operations. Now, wineries, winemakers sometimes, they feel, they taste the wines and they say, it's a little weak in tannins. I think this wine will need a bit of a tannin addition. And then you go and get tannins, okay? So that's one pretty, pretty effective way of bringing the tannins back into, into, into shape. We know that when a wine is sitting in the barrel, of course, is extract tannins. One thing that maybe is a little bit less in the, in the common sense is that when we add the chips, for example, which are typically, we think about those typically when we, when we want to add some oak aromas to the wines. They actually contain phenolics and tannins in particular that are going to be released into your wine. And you see that depending on the type of product that you have, things could be very different. So here we have a medium plus French oak chips, medium plus toast American oak chips, and some French non-toasted chips. And you see that the non-toast, of course, is much richer in phenol oxidizable phenolic compounds. But there's also a difference between two similar levels of toasting, which typically should give you two similar levels of aromas, plus different in terms of being uh, American oak or French oak. But you see that the amount of tannins that could be leaching in your wine when you add those is quite different. So that's an interesting information from a winemaker's point of view, getting more awareness about other things that you'll be bringing into your wine the moment you add an additive that in principle you might add for a specific purpose, which is not necessarily the phenolic side of stories. The list could go longer. You know, you could have been following phenolic maturity you can measure things during maturation of your grapes, as I was saying when you do your maturity control, and have start building up a database about phenolic maturity, which could be quite an interesting thing to know about your grapes, about your vineyards. You could think about adapting uh, winemaking operations to grape characteristics. Imagine you have, uh, you're making rosé wines. You have grapes that are very rich in certain phenolics. You might not want to press that very strongly because you, don't want, you might not want to extract all those phenolics in your, in your rosé wines, for example. But for whites, it's the same. You can also think a bit more in detail about how you allocate your grapes to different wine segments. If you see that your grapes are consistently, grapes from a certain vineyard are consistently higher in phenolic material that you think is, a, is representative of intrinsic quality of those grapes, you might want to allocate those grapes and keep them separated for specific segments of wine that are higher value, okay? Or you can monitor operations in the wine like fining, where you might want to remove some phenolics, but you stick to a procedure that the, 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 um, the producer or the fining agent is giving you without really knowing for your specific, specific wine in that particular vintage for that particular blend, which was the good degree of fining to remove what you wanted to remove. Now, I know this sounds good for us that are working in a laboratory, but when you are out there and you need to make a decision, I don't know if you want to deal with these uh, voltamograms a lot. You know, they look good. They look nice. You know, they show curves, peaks, and stuff. But practically speaking, they might not be that effective. Yes, the analysis is fast. But then if the data processing is complicated, that doesn't help you either. So we say, the, OK, in the process of bringing this technology to a level that it can be used in the wine industry, one aspect was how do we go from this complex fingerprint to 
why making parameters, and how do we allow people to interpret these fingerprints in a way that will talk to them, will speak to them. So keeping in mind that the analysis it takes about 30 seconds, so that remains a, a strong point, you get to here, and then what do you do about it? So what we created was, a, well, we created a big database where we have a lot of these voltammograms for a given samples compared to a lot of more conventional analysis, which could be HPLC, could be spectrophotometry, could be spectrophotometry as itself, or things like full and chocolate to for total phenolics. Sort of more wine conventional parameters, if you want. So we started running a lot of correlations between these two data sets to build up our own understanding of what these different parts of a curve are representing in terms of the wine, the composition of the sample. What does it mean to have a peak here? What does it mean to have this signal here, as opposed to another sample that doesn't have it? Does it mean that the sample is more of something, of course, but more of what? And if it's a particular molecule or family of molecules, what is their winemaking implication? So we built all that, and then we said, okay, I will make it available for people. So we said, okay, the people who are buying the instrument will have access to a, 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 a web interface where they can download the raw signal that they got from the analysis, and the system will run it through these calibration models and give them some indices, values. Okay, so that's the way the, the, the interface will look like. You, you, you download your sample on the interface, the interface will treat the curve based on the knowledge we built up. And today we're able to provide three, so maybe it's not a lot, I don't know, but three, in the, three parameters to extract from, a, from, a, from one of these complex fingerprints. One is what we call easy ox, and that's the fraction of molecules that are more easy to oxidize. So imagine you're analyzing a grape sample, white grapes. There will be all those um, hydroxycinamics and catechins that are the ones first taking part to the oxidation process. Those are the ones that is some Sauvignon Blanc, for example. You might want to be careful about whether they get oxidized, because once they get oxidized, they form these quinones, which are then going to kill your fruity aromas in your Sauvignon Blanc. We can provide also a value for total phenolics, so the total amount of phenolics that are present in your sample, uh, equivalent to a fallen chocolate tool type of analysis, okay? And if you're working on grapes and you're, you are doing a grape homogenate, so you're putting your grapes in a blender when you do your maturity control to have a value about total phenolics, that's quite relevant for red grapes. You can get this total phenolics, you can also get tannins. So a value for the tannins that are present in your grape. So over, from the overall pool of phenolics that are present in there, you will also quickly getting a value for the tannin component of that. Quite relevant for when you're assessing red grapes. So what happens then is that you don't have to deal anymore with these complex voltammograms, but you get some values. So here I'm showing you, for example, a comparison we did for four grape varieties and maturity. So then when they harvested a technological maturity, and you see that their profile is quite different. There is this Marcelin grapes, which, by the way, is a, is a hybrid being created in France, in the south, uh, in the Rhone Valley, that is quite rich in anthocyanin and other um, easily oxidizable compounds, which has been developed to stabilize, to help Grenache, which is not very stable in color to support, because Grenache is very poor in certain anthocyanin and easy oxidizable compounds, to support the stability of Grenache during time. But you see that Marceline itself is very rich in these uh, particularly oxidizable compounds, but it's not very rich in itself, in the total phenolics, neither in tannins. So of course, this Marceline in itself is probably itself likely to have a, a st color stability issues. And the Grenache as well might have some color stability issues. So the blend of the two is probably interesting, but you see how you can pick the, the existence of these specific phenolic profiles, which eventually you can try to use into your, your uh, winemaking in terms of how you blend things and how you, how you make the best out of the grapes you have. Or for example, you see here we got four parcels of uh, Chardonnay from the same winery. So think about that typically these parcels are treated in the winery in the same way. So they go in the winery all separate because the wineries in Burgundy is very keen about vinification of each parcel individually, but they have a one protocol that they apply across the board, okay? Which is quite typical in wineries, nothing wrong with that. But then when you start measuring what's in these four 
lots of Chardonnay, you can see that in particular two are very different. One is very rich in phenolics, certainly the richest in phenolics, but it's also very rich in the very easily oxidizable portion of those phenolics. So that could lead to certain consideration about the oxidability of this one. Whereas there's a second one, which is relatively rich in phenolics too, but it's not very rich in these oxidiz oxidizable phenolics. So again, it could be much more stable from the point of view of these oxidability notions, okay? Because it doesn't have the sort of um, the difficult molecules to handle. It doesn't have a lot of that, okay? It's not as rich as others. So, as I said, be with me for a second when we have these uh, profiles, because we can go now from those uh, voltammograms. If we use this easy ox index, you can see that we could rank those grapes for, for the value of the easy ox index. And for all those grapes, because this is, a, this is a vineyard, as I said, that is in our research facility, we'll be running a lot of different experiments on the mass from those grapes. In particular, we'll be monitoring the way they, they go in an oxidation experiment like the one I showed before with the oxygen saturations. And you see that the grapes that are very high in this easy ox, they were systematically the grapes that were oxidizing fast, consuming oxygen faster, going to browning much faster than all the other ones. So these might be the grapes that you might want to think about in terms of, okay, these are gonna oxidize faster. If I choose to do this hyperoxygenation, these are the grapes that I need to treat certainly with more oxygen saturation. And I might want to do that actually because these grapes will retain otherwise some of those easy oxidizable phenolics that are transferring to my wine. Whereas there might be others where you might not want to worry about that at all. At all. You might so save time, save money, might not even worry about doing fining on the mast because they, don't need that, they might not need that much or doing less fining than you would do normally. And so that could be quite interesting for you in terms of streamlining your winemaking process, predicting a little bit the winemaking needs of your grapes before they come in the winery. If you have the time to do just one check close to maturity, you will know what those grapes you need. You will know what you need to do on those grapes to get the most of them with the less effort. You can also be monitoring maceration, for example, red wine extraction. I'm going out of the story of the pure uh, white wine oxidability again. So that you see that, uh, you know, obviously the easy oxidizable compounds are the ones that are coming out very easily without the need of ethanol being present, that the stuff present in the pulp and uh, to some extent in the skin. So you see your rich plateau very easily. Here, Greenwich Noir maceration at six days, seven days, it's already done. But if you want to get extraction of those tannins, which obviously will need the um, time and the alcohol to come out. This will contribute to the phenox fraction, so the index that measures the total phenolics that are present in your sample. And you see that to get that coming out and to build up some level of those, of course you need a little bit more time, but once again, now you can measure exactly what's going on. We know in theory, okay, we know by enology books that these ones will come later than these ones, but now you can measure it. So. Practically speaking, you can think of managing it. Okay, I'm going towards my conclusion. So the last bit is going back to the concept of wine oxidability. We started with this tool because we wanted to monitor, to, to understand which wines will need more oxygen. And so which wines will need our closure that delivers more oxygen, as opposed to other wines which we need to close with a closure that allows less oxygen. So that was the initial story. The initial reason why we got into this, um, into investigating this technology and eventually developing this tool. But as you've seen that we got dragged away on the side, the dark side of the force having to do with grapes and, and stuff because we thought it was very relevant, because we thought we started dealing with things, we thought it was a more immediate type of application. We thought it was still very relevant, but it was more like management of winemaking and decision making in the winery. But going back to the, to, the, um, to the original concept, we said, okay, what happens if we, if we take a range of wines, we give to all of them five milligrams of oxygen, for example. We let it consume, so that's part of the first data I've shown with the cause of oxygen consumption and so on. And then we do this voltammetric analysis before and after oxygen, or with and without the five milligrams of oxygen. Okay, so we always have a control for each wine that hasn't received the five milligrams of oxygen. And then we, we obtain this new plot, which is a kind of difference, saying, okay, which are the things that have been changing? We can do different type of data treatments on this, um, this new signal that we obtain. And eventually we put all these data back together and we compare it with the simple observations that we made. So which are the ones that are losing more SO2 once again? Which are the ones that are consuming faster oxygen? So again, this notion of oxidability. 
So we put this again on a PCA, it was a hand sharing before, it's sort of way to, to, to look at trends that exist in a data set, to look at correlations that might exist in a data set. And it turns out that we could separate, to some extent, wines based on their ability to consume oxygen. So we could uh, separate this set of 13 commercial, these are commercial wines, wines we don't know anything about. Just went into a supermarket and bought them. We run them through our laboratory in this experiment, very controlled conditions, similar to what you heard before in the presentation of Andrew Waterhouse, you know, with the samples being closed with different closures. We measure how much oxygen before we close them. So we know what these ones have been doing in, the, in our laboratory. We don't know what they are beforehand, but it turns out, based on these analyses we do, we can separate them into ones that are able to consume oxygen faster and, able, and less able to consume oxygen. And that's the way the voltammetric profiles will look, like, will look like. So you see there's several features that come in common for these ones compared to these ones. So now we're in the process of building a big database. Well, big. Building a database as big as we can, allowing us to, to sort of categorize these ones to develop predictive abilities in terms of the way they will interact with oxygen. Progressively, we'll add the layers and, of uh, information into the data, this database. Eventually, our ultimate goal is to be able to say, okay, these are the wines that are aromatically, for example, more sensitive to oxygen. For white wines, it's quite important. We aren't to that point yet, but we have now some parameters, relatively rich set of information, because you see each one of these curves is quite articulated in itself. So we think that this can help us in making this database, which of course will be then part of the user interface. So you could then download some of your voltammetric profiles on there, or maybe you will have to do some of these experiments. We hope that you wouldn't have to do the experiments and from the raw voltammetric profile, we can extract some features that we can relate to this. But eventually this will, our goal is to make this part of the, 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 the web interface where you can download samples Uh, analytical results and get some of this information. So just concluding, as I said, you know, uh, from the conclusion I'm going back to my first point. Don't expect this to answer all your questions. This remains a quite complicated network of chemical reactions. It's more like this oxidability is like a property of the wine, okay? It's a characteristic, intrinsic characteristic of the wine. But it involves a lot of factors, like a very complex story with a lot of uh, characters in it. The interesting thing today is that we know most of these characters individually, but it's the, just the interaction that remains complicated. A wine, as we heard before, it might have a lot of iron and not a lot of those oxidizable phenolics and still undergo important oxidation phenomena. Another wine might have little iron, but might have a lot of those, and you might still find out that this wine oxidizes to some extent. Or that iron might not be that available for a lot of reaction. Or when you give SO2 to the wine, it's stuff binding to it, so that SO2 will be less effective. So it's quite complicated. But the interesting thing is now to be able to measure the process or part of this process, rather than getting stuck into wanting to quantify the individual factor, which is at a winery level, is very complicated to do. And the, 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 um, the key in our approach, in the approach we took, was the development of these uh, disposable electrodes applied to a conventional voltammetric uh, setup, which by the way now is also miniaturized, miniaturized and cheaper in the little device which I've shown. So the, the concept is to bring into Winer is now a tool for you to be able to implement strategies and winemaking protocols that allows you to make wines that are more resistant against oxidation. Of course, that doesn't mean that the instrument will come with a recipe. You have to build up your own uh, database and knowledge your learning curve about what those values means, but the important thing is that now you can measure what you're doing at every single step of, of the process before even the grapes are coming in the winery, actually. And that was it for me, and for the day, actually. Thank you. Thank you.